Thank you, Munir. I don't know, should I make a comment about being the last speaker? I hope I can keep you awake and thank you all for attending and thanks, Munir, for inviting me. This has been a very exciting conference. So I'm going to talk today about transporters and precision medicine. And um, these are my disclosures. I'm a co-founder of a small company and I consult for some larger companies. Um, so I'm going to give you an introduction and tell you about why you should care about transporters in precision medicine, give you that. Then I'm going to talk about biomarkers marrying large data sets of genomics and metabolomics for transporters and how we can use that in more precise dosing. I'll then go on to large genome-wide association studies of metformin, both in terms of drug levels as well as response, and I'll finally talk about conclusions and future directions. So this is a slide showing the homology relationships of the transporters in the human genome in the solute carrier superfamily. So there's some 400 transporters um, in the genome, and they cluster together in 52 families. They mostly sit on plasma membranes. Some of them sit on intracellular membranes, like lysosomal membranes, et cetera. They bring solutes across plasma membranes, uh, across membranes, and those solutes can range from things we need, like vitamins, amino acids, um, uh, heavy metals, uh, inorganic ions. And many drugs take a ride on these transporters. So these transporters play an important role in drug disposition as well as drug targeting. So I'm going to talk today about transporters in one particular family, the SLCO family. Mary Relling mentioned one transporter in this family, SLCO1B1, and I'll be talking about that and discovering biomarkers for that transporter. I'll talk about GLUT2, a transporter that plays an important role in Mendelian disease, and I'll also talk about its role in response to metformin and, and highlight the fact that many pharmacogenes also play a role in uh, rare diseases. And then finally, I'll talk about a nucleoside transporter and its role in metformin um, disposition. So just reminding you that transporters serve as drug targets, and I think everybody here is aware of the SSRI antidepressants, which target the serotonin transporter. And then there's the SNRIs, which target serotonin and norepinephrine transporters. More recently, a whole new class of drugs have been developed which target glucose transporters in the kidneys. And these are the glyphalazins, and they tar target the glucose transporters, prevent reabsorption of glucose, and we cause, uh, and cause spilling of glucose and treatment of diabetes. Um, and then there's other drugs that are transporting that are targeted now, and, and, and more and more. Um, Transporters also play a role, and Munir mentioned that I'm head of a, of a regulatory science consortium funded by FDA, but transporters also play a very important role in drug toxicity because they're sites for drug-drug um, interaction. So one drug may inhibit the transporter and change the drug level of another drug. And I show you particularly transporters in the liver, kidney, and intestine, which may be sites for drug-drug interactions. Um, and the International Transporter Consortium works sort of together uh, with FDA scientists and has uh, written or has uh, co-authored a number of papers in this journal, Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, talking about new events in transporter-mediated drug-drug interactions. Um, Transporters also have pharmacogenetics, and CPIC guidances pick up on at least one of them, and hopefully we'll, 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 we'll convince them to pick up on more than one, but this is ABCG2. Um, it's a transporter which has a very common variant found at allele frequencies of 30 percent in East Asians to down to 1 percent in individuals of African ancestry. It, this transporter it interacts with a whole lot of clinically used drugs, and this transporter variant plays a role in changes in drug disposition and drug safety. Um, the one that's more familiar, at least with CPIC, is SLCO1B1, and there again we have a non-synonymous variant shown over here, um, and that variant is found at allele frequencies, at different allele frequencies in different populations, and it is the most... Uh, uh, you know, cited form of statin-induced um, myopathy or ca more causal for statin-induced myopathies. 
All right, so that gives you an introduction of the importance of transporters in drug response as drug targets, as well as as mediators of drug-drug interactions and playing a role in, uh, in ADME and pharmacokinetics. I now want to talk about biomarkers for transporters and why we're interested in those. Um, and so uh, I'll tell you a story. This is a postdoc, a former postdoc in my laboratory, Jen Hibma. Um, and she was very interested in carrying out a clinical transporter study. Um, and so what we did was we looked at FDA. They put out guidances for drug-drug interactions. And those guidances often involve uh, metabolic enzymes, but also a number of transporters are on their list. Um, and uh, so we looked at their guidance, and, and the guidance tells you here's some in vitro studies to do, and those in vitro studies will inform whether or not you need to do a clinical drug-drug interaction um, study. So Jen carried out some in vitro studies, and she predicted that famotidine, um, uh, an H2 receptor antagonist, would cause a clinically relevant drug-drug interaction with metformin, an anti-diabetic drug. Using FDA guidances, which, by the way, EMA also has similar guidances for, you know, when you're going to see a drug-drug interaction. Um, so then we designed this drug-drug interaction study um, using those guidances. And here are the drug levels versus time. And we published this a couple years later after a couple years of work. And here are metformin levels alone and metformin levels with famotidine. So we obviously did not see any clinically relevant drug-drug interaction. And by the way, these guidances are used uh, to inform pharmaceutical industry when they're developing drugs on when they need to do a drug-drug interaction. So you can see we had here a clearly a false positive. Um, and uh, since then, FDA has published uh, um, um, a... Um, uh, a review, and they've basically looked at, um, you know, when you see a drug-drug interaction and when you don't. And you can see they have, um, in 33 uh, clinical drug-drug interaction studies, their guidance predicted 16 of them really truly, but there were nine false positives, and Jen's was one of those false positives um, that occurred. So that made us begin to think, can we do better than these in vitro studies to inform in vivo studies? Can we use clinical biomarkers, metabolic biomarkers in particular, metabolomic biomarkers? Because these transporters are handling a lot of endogenous metabolites. Um, so we decided we're going to, we took on a big program to discover biomarkers of transporters that can be used as in vivo predictors of drug drug interactions, and we could learn new biology about the transporters. So we mined publicly available data, and there were some nice data out there where they had taken 7,000 individuals, they'd taken a blood sample, they did metabolomic profiling on the blood sample of all 7,000 individuals. At the same time, they did a genome-wide chip, so they did a GWAS study. Um, and then they, you, could, you could look at it in any way, and they did the GWAS of the metabolite. We were interested in the metabolites that associated with the, with the transporters that mediate drug-drug interactions. And so we said, which metabolites associate with transporter polymorphisms? And we decided we go first and look at OATP1B1. OATP1B1 is this very important transporter in the liver. Transports a whole bunch of different drugs, statins, all sorts of anionic drugs into the liver where they're metabolized. Um, it's also associated with statin-induced myopathy for those reasons. Here's a list of some of the drugs that are um, uh, transported by OATP1B1. Um, and so you can imagine it would mediate drug-drug interactions where one drug could inhibit it and prevent the other drug from getting into the liver and being metabolized. Um, and um, it has a variant, a genetic variant, OATP1B1 valine to alanine that we described. Um, and so we thought, let's use GWAS to discover endogenous metabolites of OATP1B1 by looking at this genetic variant. Um, and so we mined those publicly available data for variants in OATP1B1 and which metabolites associated with those variants. So here you're looking at a traditional Manhattan plot. I think that's the pointer. Um, you're looking at a Manhattan plot. Right up here is that valine to alanine um, a genetic variant. And you see we get a P less than minus 300. This particular metabolite um, is a conjugate. Um, I think it's a bile acid conjugate. 
Um, and then we saw, uh, I think, a total of 12 others. I'm just showing you here six that are associated with metabolites that come from these metabolomic association studies that are associated with genetic variants in OATP1B1. And usually that valine to alanine uh, non-synonymous mutation is at the top. Um, so we discovered a couple of new things. So first of all, we discovered new kinds of substrates. Um, so if you look here at TDA, tetradecane dioate, and hexadecane dioate, those dioates were not known to be substrates of this particular transporter. You could also see we discovered another enzyme involved in the pathway. So we learned that that, that enzyme may also play a role in the disposition uh, of these two metabolites. Um, so here they are. So just discovering an association doesn't mean that these, um, these metabolites are actually substrates of this transporter, so we had to do that kind of work. So we um, validated the metabolites in vitro as substrates of OATP1B1, and, and then we did a clinical DDI study. Um, all right, so here are cells expressing OATP1B1 and empty vector cells. And you can see that we get an uptake of tetradecane dioate, TDA, and HDA in the OATP1B1 cell. So these are true substrates of the transporters. We picked them up in metabolomic studies, and now we see that they're substrates of the transporters. Um, we then said, OK, what about clinically? And so we collaborated with Deanna Kretz next door. She had done a clinical drug-drug interaction study in which she gave pravastatin to healthy volunteers. Um, and she gave pravastatin plus cyclosporin. Um, and here's what she saw. She saw pravastatin levels went up, um, up here, uh, in the presence of cyclosporin because cyclosporin inhibits OATP1B1 and causes the levels to go up because pravastatin can no longer be metabolized. Well, if our biomarkers are truly biomarkers of OATP1B1, they should also go up. Um, and so what we did was we took her plasma samples um, and we measured HDA, which is supposedly a biomarker for OATP1B1. Our data are suggesting that. And what we found was this, and here you go. In her data set, we found that um, HDA went up. We also saw the same with TDA. We measured a bunch of the biomarkers that we've seen, and they go up. So what does this mean for drug development? This means that what they can do, instead of an in vitro study, they can simply, I think I animated it in, they can simply test their new drug in, let's say, a phase one clinical trial, measure HDA levels um, in the presence of their new drug, and see if, in fact, they go up. If it goes up, it might mean the new drug is inhibiting OATP1B1, phenocopying that genetic variant. Um, and this is a very good way to then go on and say, okay, let's do those clinical drug-drug interaction studies that are required by FDA and EMA, um, and probably a little bit more robust than doing in vitro studies like we had to do or like Jen, poor Jen had to do uh, only to get a negative result. But now there's a number of studies going on all over the world. Pharmaceutical industry is quite interested in these biomarkers because that will help them a lot when they're developing new drugs to predict prudential drug-drug interactions. Okay, now I'm going to move on and talk about metformin genome-wide uh, studies. Um, so, as you know, metformin is first-line therapy, at least in the U.S., I think here too, uh, for type 2 diabetes. It's highly transported. Um, and 35 percent of patients do not respond adequately to metformin and have to go on um, a second drug usually. Um, so we asked the question many years ago, actually several years ago, um, with um, Ewan Pearson and others. Um, and we carried out a genome-wide association study uh, in 7,000. We've now doubled that number, not yet published, but we have replicated um, what we found. And what we found was a transporter is highly associated with poor response to metformin. So that was happy news for me because I love transporters. So this is a glucose transporter, GLUT2. And those genetic variants predicted better response, actually, to metformin if you had certain genetic variants. Um, it sits in the liver, this particular transporter, 
Um, and it pushes glucose out when you're fasting, and when you've eaten a meal, it brings glucose into the liver. Um, and people with a particular genetic variant respond better to metformin, so that was interesting. At the same time, and this is true with a lot of pharmacogenes, um, rare variants in this transporter, not the common ones we identified as being associated with metformin response, but rare variants in this transporter cause um, uh, Mendelian disease, and in this case, it caused a disease called fanconi bickel syndrome, and it's a glycogen storage disease, and so what happens, I think I animated it, and what happens is if you have mutations in GLUT2, um, you accumulate glycogen because glucose can't get out at night when you're fasting, so it just forms glycogen, and they get these big bellies, you know, big uh, glycogen stores in, in their liver. Um, and that results, by the way, because this is, you know, you're born with it, small stature, sometimes mental retardation, et cetera, poor development. Um, but there is a range, as there is with all these phenotypes, uh, with all these Mendelian disease of phenotypes. And some kids, and these were two that were reported in the literature, they had a different set of genetic variants in GLUT2, um, and they didn't get uh, as they didn't get hepatomegaly, they seemed to be normal height, and they didn't have kidney dysfunction, but they still had these diseases. So we were quite interested in whether the spectrum of phenotypes could associate with the activity of the transporters that these kids harbored. Um, and so um, we, this is Jessica Inaguro in my laboratory, boy, she reviewed the literature and got all the different, this is the secondary structure of GLUT2, so it goes through the membrane a whole bunch of times. Um, and these, we've annotated it with the genetic variants and, you know, their missense, in-frame deletions. These have never been studied. All these that I'm circling or putting a square around have never been studied or characterized. Um, so we thought, let's have a look at them, and in particularly, let's have a look at the ones here that are associated with that mild phenotype and see if we can explain that uh, phenotype. So we ask, how do they function and how do they uh, affect glucose function? And you can see we've done this in <clears throat> xenopus oocytes, and we get a nice robust uptake of 2-deoxyglucose in oocytes expressing GLUT2. And, um, <coughs> and then... Um, that's inhibited by, um, let me get that, it's inhibited by fluoritin. And then these are all the genetic variants. And you can see they hard later are associated with fanconi bickel syndrome. And here's the variant that's associated with the milder phenotype. It's still very low. I've cut the axes here. Still has very low function, but it's associated, it's still a better function, which told us a couple things, that you might be able to treat people with these disease by just increasing the function a little bit. You don't have to increase it um, all the way to the reference allele. Um, we then, um, so because metformin is currently being used in many clinical trials, and this is my last sort of set of slides, um, um, we asked the question of what are the genetic determinants of metformin drug levels. Um, so metformin is, I don't know if you know, but metformin, at least in the U.S., is one of these new wonder drugs. Um, it's being used for healthy aging. It's being used for cancer. People are using it in neurological diseases, all sorts of diseases. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov in the U.S., you find at least 500 metformin clinical trials uh, going on. Um, and that's because it has some beneficial effects. Um, it's even being tried in people who are just old to see if it can prevent, <laughs> just give it to them, and see if it can prevent um, some age-related diseases. And I can tell you the design of that study, very interesting. So um, we thought, well, let's look at the genetic determinants of metformin levels, because that will cut across all of these different uh, studies. So we asked, what are the genetic determinants of metformin pharmacokinetics? We got in touch with our MetGen consortium, with Ewan Pearson et al., um, and we got people who had metformin um, drug levels and had received metformin, and we found some genetic determinants here. First, we found differences in um, 
in metformin levels based on ethnicity. So Europeans on the same dose have lower levels, they have a higher clearance than Asians who have higher levels. And this is normalized for body weight. Um, so that was kind of interesting and we're interested in discovering what that is to you. We then did a transporter wide, transporter ohm wide study of metformin levels with the idea of discovering metformin transporters because it is highly polar and needs to be transported. Um, and uh, we found that OCT1 and OCT2, which have been already documented as metformin transporters, associate with uh, metformin drug levels. Um, and we found, interestingly, a uh, heavy, um, an, an, an inorganic ion transporter that's associated with metformin levels. And then we found a nucleoside transporter that's associated with metformin. So we found a bunch of them, and we're now looking at whether these transporters are metformin transporters. And sure enough, this, um, this nucleoside transporter that we identified is um, CNT1, transports metformin. So we're using this as a way to look at other transporters that may take up metformin. We've got to do more validation on this as well as some of the other transporters to determine what other transporters may take up this drug and may relate to metformin drug levels. Um, so let me conclude. Um, SLC transporters play major roles in drug disposition and response. Novel biomarkers of OATP1B1 and indeed many of the transporters that are responsible for drug-drug interactions are being discovered and may be used to determine transporter activity. GLUT2 is associated with response to metformin and function of GLUT2 variants uh, associates with the phenotype of Fanconi-Bickel syndrome. And transporter OM-wide studies are being used to reveal new transporters for metformin. And these are the individuals that uh, I want to highlight the MetGen Consortia. I want to highlight Jessica Anagero and Elizabeth Ennis for doing the uh, studies on metformin and Sukwa Yi for the biomarker studies. Thank you very much for waiting to the end of this day. Thank you. So, so do we actually know how metformin works? No, that's always, you know, people have all different hypotheses. It's an AMPK activator, it's an energy lower, there's all sorts of but different the things. the mechanism action it's still... still not. You know, it could be very pleiotropic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any questions for Kathy? So, so in healthy aging, do you think that they should be giving it to certain people with certain transporter variants rather than to well, every, the whole population? I mean, if this study is positive, that they've agreed with FDA, if they get a positive outcome they're get going, and people actually live longer or don't have a major life event on metformin, they're taking old guys into the study, waiting for them to have that, they will change the label of metformin, it's been agreed and it will say it can be used for healthy aging. And had, are they collecting DNA that you can yeah, look at? Yeah, they to are. See? Oh, They're fabulous. collecting DNA and everything. And how big is that study? Um, they've all, I mean, this is what worries me. There's only so far 3,000 people, but they claim they've powered it and that people should see longer life or longer time to one of those life-threatening events, a stroke. I think it's a, a, a stroke, a heart attack. Okay. or. So 3,000 may not be enough, really. I, feel, I feel like so he's going to fail. I mean, he's going to fail, and we've, we've tried to, you know, put some input in, but it's yeah. 3,000, okay. so we'll see. All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Oh, I shouldn't take this off. So um, it just leaves me to close uh, the conference. I just want to thank a few people, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, the speakers. Uh, we've had fantastic talks. All the speakers have been... Amazing, and the advances which have occurred even since last year uh, is, is, is uh, breathtaking uh, in many areas. And I think that uh, this will continue, uh, and, and you know, the network is there to be able to hopefully help in the interaction between people working in different areas. But obviously, I want to thank Christine uh, and, and my, uh, my sort of team as well from Liverpool, who've been uh, very much involved in uh, running this conference. Uh, they've been very, very very good, very so efficient, uh, and, and you know we should thank them. So, <laughs> and of course we should thank the Royal College of Physicians and the AV team here as well, who've done a, a great job as well. So thank you very much.
And finally, thanks to you uh, for staying till the end, uh, for participating, uh, and uh, we will see you next year. Have a safe journey home. Thank you.